Well, good morning. It is a joy for me to be with you this morning. I had a wonderful time in the first hour with the previous group that was in here. Uh, this is a, it's a thrill for me to be here on a Sunday morning. I have been uh, able to be here a couple of times throughout the years on a Friday evening for a, a men's event. I was here last August for a men's event and then I think a couple of years previous to that. Uh, but this is my first time on a, on a Sunday morning, and it is a real joy for me to be here and, and just to see how this uh, local congregation has, has extended hospitality to so many people, to, to me included, has been a real blessing. So I want to thank you for that, and I want to thank Pastor Tom and, and the organizers of the conference for giving me the privilege of speaking on some very difficult texts. Uh, they, they must have been quite... Uh, 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 you know, there must have been a lot of other conferences going on at the time that they couldn't get other speakers to address some of these topics. So they're quite desperate, and so they reached out to me to address these, uh, these very important texts. And uh, I'll pray that the Lord, and have prayed, that the Lord will use me to, uh, uh, to uh, help unfold them uh, for you. Well, for this hour, uh, we are going to look at Revelation 20 and its surrounding context, I've entitled this seminar, The Reign of the Last Adam, A Case for the Future Millennial Reign of Christ. I want to say at the very beginning that there's a lot of material that we're going to try to go through, just like in the previous session, and uh, the slides have a lot of material on them as well, and I want to say this, that I will make the slides available later So that alleviates you from trying to capture everything if you're taking notes. You know that you can have access to the same notes that you'll hear on these or see on these slides. uh, And that way, uh, be able to focus more on on the the teaching itself. But to begin with, I want to read from Revelation chapter 19 and 20. Turn in your Bibles there. Our focus will be primarily on chapter 20, but I have to begin... Uh, in, uh, in chapter 19, in verse 11, as, as we focus on the reign of Christ. Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11, and we will read through 20, verse 6. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses." From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and all the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, the small and the great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army." And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet, who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh." Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, 
and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and the judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now this portion of the book of Revelation, and in fact this portion of all of Scripture, has been the source of a tremendous amount of scrutiny and division. In particular, the issue comes down to how we relate what we just read in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, how we relate that to what immediately preceded Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 21. A great deal of of division and debate has arisen over that issue, and it is represented today in the different eschatological systems. You've undoubtedly heard of them. Now, to begin with, as we tackle this issue of what is the right view, what is the right understanding of these texts, we have to begin with some basic terms and definitions as we start. First of all, eschatology. You probably have heard that term quite a bit over the last three days. Eschatology is the study of the last things. It comes from the Greek adjective eschatos, which means last or final. And so eschatology refers to the study of the last things. And when it comes to the study of the last things, the pivotal issue related to the debate has to do with the the timing of the second coming of Christ to this earth in relation to the millennial reign described in chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, in relation to the thousand years. All Bible-believing conservative theologians believe in a second coming. No one disputes the details recorded in chapter 19, verses 11 to 21, and, and, and the, the return of Christ to crush the enemies. That is not under dispute, but what is under dispute is how chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, relates to the coming of Christ on the horse with the sword coming out of his mouth and a robe dipped in blood. Therefore, out of this debate have arisen three primary fundamental views in how to understand the relationship of the coming of Christ to these thousand years. You have the view of premillennialism, the view of amillennialism, and the view of postmillennialism. Let me briefly define each of those, and when you actually look at them, the, the de- definitions are, are quite intuitive. First of all, let's look at premillennialism. Premillennialism. The view of premillennialism is that Christ's second coming, Revelation 19, verses 11 to 21, occurs immediately before his millennial reign, Revelation 20, verses 1 to 6. So premillennialism looks at the verses that we read as being sequential in nature. It flows in in its chronology. And so, if you had put it into a timeline, you would see it that way, this way. We, we have the first coming, and, and we're all agreed on the first coming of Christ. Then you have the second coming, and the second coming inaugurates what is known as the millennial kingdom. 
Revelation 19, verses 11 to 21, inaugurates Revelation 20, verses 1 to 6, a period of a thousand years, a millennial reign, that is then ultimately followed by the new heaven and the new earth. Now, you can understand premillennialism by just looking at the word and seeing the prefixed preposition pre. So when you see pre-millennialism, pre-millennium, that refers to how proponents of this view, where they place the return of Christ, the second advent, is pre-millennium, prior to or at the beginning of the millennial reign. Then you have amillennialism. Amillennialism believes that Christ's second coming, his second advent, occurs without a literal reign of Christ. Without. And you have the prefixed preposition a, which often negates words. And so in some senses, this view really cancels out the concept of a literal thousand-year reign. Now, proponents of all millennialism will be uncomfortable with what this title literally designates because proponents of amillennialism say, no, we don't reject a millennial reign, we just interpret it as spiritual or metaphorical in nature. Christ is reigning now. He's already reigning. And so in their system, the return of Christ really happens after the reign. They they believe that the reign is happening from heaven. Christ is on his throne. Revelation 20 verses 1 to 6 is already in focus. It's already applied. It's realized. So in that sense, Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 to 21 happens after Revelation 20 verses 1 to 6. You have a similar view, though with a different expression. It's called post-millennialism. And so when you look at this term, you see the prefix preposition post. You attach that to the second advent of Christ, and you get a view that says that Christ will clearly come back after the millennium. Now you might say, well, that sounds almost like amillennialism. Yes, but not quite. Because proponents of post-millennialism, not all, but many post-millennialists, will still believe in a literal millennial reign. But it's not one in which Christ is actually on the earth. Rather, this reign is the reign of the church, the reign of the gospel over the face of the earth for a thousand years or thereabouts, For a thousand years, the gospel will reign. The church will rule. Christ will not be on the throne, but he will be reigning through his delegates, his surrogates here on earth, and they will rule over this world with truth and justice. And so in this case, the millennial reign is a reign of the church, and it will usher in the return of Christ. Those are the three major eschatological views, the three ways of looking at the relationship of Revelation 19, 11 to 21, and Revelation 20, verses 1 to 6. Now, what I want to do this morning is give you five arguments in favor of the first of these three positions, the position of premillennialism. Five arguments in defense of the view that... Revelation 19, verses 11 to 21, precedes, in chronology, Revelation 20, verses 1 to 6. And these arguments will will be taken largely from the actual text of Revelation 19 and 20, though we'll, we'll also, the last one will have a little bit of a broader perspective on these. And like I said, uh, this is all going to be available on the slides later, so if you don't get all the points that are mentioned, because some of this is a little technical, and there's information to take down here, the slides will be made available later. The first of these is this. The first of these five arguments in defense of premillennialism, 
in defense of the view that Christ returns to inaugurate his 1,000-year kingdom, the first of these arguments is this, the sequence of the visions. The sequence of the visions. Now look for a moment at chapter 19, verse 11. We read these words. And I saw. And I saw. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. Then look at Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw. Then I saw. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. Now, what we notice here, and and there's more to this, but this is just to to initiate the discussion here, what we see is a special formula that begins these verses, and I saw. In the Greek, it's it's a formula that stands out immediately, and it's kai adon, kai adon, and I saw, or then I saw. And it is used by John at different points throughout Revelation to introduce a new revelatory vision that he had been given by the Lord Jesus. Every time one of these visions is given to him, going all the way back, actually, the first time we come across this is is chapter 5, verse 1. He he introduces it with this phraseology, this formula, and I saw. And it it indicates to the reader that he's beginning a new vision vision. He's describing a new vision. Now, it occurs throughout the book of Revelation, but what is important to note is that there is a special sequence, a special listing of these these, uh, vision formula in the last three chapters of Revelation. It occurs eight times, the final eight times. This Kai Adon occurs beginning in chapter 19, verse 11, and then ending, the last one ends in chapter 21, verse 1, where where John receives the vision of the new heaven and new earth. Now, you could list these visions as follows. The first of the eight begin 19, verse 11. The second, 19, verse 17. The third, 19, verse 19. The the, the fourth, 20, verse 1. The fifth, 20, verse 4. The sixth, 20, verse 11 the 7th, 20, verse 12, and the 8th, 21, verse 1. Kai Edan, eight times, eight different visions, eight different revelations. Now, across all the theological positions, premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism, those visions... Those sequ- the sequence of those visions are believed to be sequential except the Kai Edon found twice in Revelation 20, the first time in verse 1 and the second time in verse, 20, verse 4. So every view believes that the first three are sequential and the last three are sequential. Now, premillennialism, the case that I am making this morning, would also believe that the middle two, Kaedon visions, are also sequential. So there is a movement in sequence from one to the next without break. However, a amillennial position and a postmillennial position will take the two middle visions, the one beginning in 20 verse 1 and the one in 20 verse 4, and say they are out of sequence. In fact, what they do is they argue that the vision of chapter 20, verses 1 to 3, and the vision of chapter 20, verses 4 to 10, actually occur way prior in sequence to 19, verse 11. It is out of place, they argue. They call it recapitulation, that John, for a moment stops after he has described the second advent of Christ, he stops and then receives a new vision that takes him all the way back to the beginning of the church age. He describes that and then he comes back to pick up where he left off. That's how the amillennialists and postmillennialists 
uh, uh, theologian will take these sequence of the visions. But here's the thing. This is very important. There is nothing in the text, nothing in chapter 20, verse 1, or chapter 20, verse 4, which at all indicates to John's readers that they are to hit the rewind button when they get to chapter 20, verse 1. There's no special word. There's no unusual grammar. There's nothing to suggest why you take the first three sequential, but then the next two non-sequential, and then the last three as sequential. Nothing at all. One writer then responds this way. Many of these commentators who take these visions out of sequence, many of these commentators discount any predictive significance to these visions. That is not surprising given their view that biblical prophecy and apocalyptic is mythological. In other words, you can't draw information from it. You can draw inspiration, they'll say, from prophecy. You can draw encouragement and comfort from prophecy, but you can't draw information from prophecy. So this writer, Craig Blazing, says, many commentators already begin with this presupposition that you can't, you, you can't base any doctrine off of prophetic material. And he goes on to say this, it is noteworthy, however, that when the issue of theological and historical significance is suspended and the question is strictly literary, in other words, let's put all theological presuppositions aside. Let's look just at the language of the text. Let's not even consider the eschatological positions. Let's just look at how the Greek language works. He says there is general agreement that the events of the visions of 19 verse 11 to 21 verse 8 are correlative with or consequent to the one that first began in 19 verse 11. All that to say from the first argument, the argument that refers to literary structure, there is nothing in the literary structure or the grammar that tells us from John's pen that chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, does not come after chapter 19, verses 11 to 21. It's the argument from the sequence of the visions. Secondly, the second argument in favor of a premillennial position that the, the second advent comes before the millennium is what we'll say is the incarceration of the devil. The incarceration of the devil found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. Here, John writes as follows, and here's one of the visions that he receives. He describes it here. He writes, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Now, a second issue that all of these three positions have to deal with, premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism, is how you deal with the binding of Satan. To what does that refer? John clearly sees it. He sees what is all involved with it. And so it, it, it begs the question, to what does this vision refer? Now, for a premillennialist position, the view that Christ's second advent comes before this millennial reign, premillennialism takes this as a consequence of what we read of in chapter 19. Christ returned on a stallion with a sword, with the great army of heaven, and waged war and conquered and devastated all his opponents leaving all of the human opponents dead and then taking the false prophet and the beast and, and putting them in the lake of fire. But that leaves the third 
member of that satanic trinity, Satan himself, it leaves him under question. What happened to him? Premillennialists say, well, Christ deals with him as well. He sends this angel who binds Satan and incarcerates him. Now, amillennialists and postmillennialists, on the other hand, believe that the incarceration of Satan actually is a reality today. He is incarcerated. Remember, a postmillennial or amillennial position places the second advent of Christ after a reign, whether that is a spiritual reign or whether that is a literal reign of the church. Postmillennialism and amillennialism say that the second advent of Christ, when he comes in that that devastating way against all his enemies, it comes at the, at the end of the millennium. So then how do you relate the binding of Satan to this reign? Premillennialists say the binding of Satan comes as a result of Christ's advent. Postmillennialism and amillennialism says no, Christ comes after the binding of Satan. He is already bound. One proponent A post-millennialist by the name of David Chilton describes it this way. Before the first coming of Christ, Satan controlled the nations. But now his death grip has been shattered by the gospel as the good news of the kingdom has spread throughout the world. In other words, Satan has been vanquished. He is in bondage as described in chapter 20 verses 1 to 3. But let's look at the language a little more carefully. Going back to Revelation 20, we read that the angel laid hold and bound Satan. Now, it's interesting to note that in Mark chapter 6, verse 17, those same two verbs are used, laid hold and bound. It's used to describe what happened to John the Baptist. He was arrested and put in chains. Those same verbs are used here, and it, it gives the impression not just of, a, uh, of a, a, an impediment or some kind of obstacle, it gives the impression, the description of actual, uh, of a binding, of an arrest, of an incarceration. In fact, it, it, the, the text goes on to say that the angel threw him into the abyss and shut and sealed it. Uh, And this language gives the impression of complete or absolute confinement. That Satan has been put in solitary confinement. Now, if you're familiar at all with the prison system, we have something like that today. And the reason for solitary confinement is so that that prisoner held there cannot... it's, It's not so that he won't affect the people outside, although that... That has already been assumed by being put in prison in the first place, but it is so that he has no access to prisoners themselves. No access. It is complete. It is absolute. And notice he is thrown into the abyss. This is important because a post-millennialist and an amillennialist will in the end acknowledge that Satan still is in this earth. And so they take the word abyss and say, well, the abyss is really not the abyss. The abyss is just a lower place than heaven. The abyss is this world. But the term abyss is never used to refer to the place below heaven, the earth. It is used to refer to the place of the dead, the netherworld, a place that is below the earth. Moreover, the purpose of this confinement is to confine Satan so that he has no activity, no influence on the earth. Verse 3 says, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. One commentator says this, the elaborate measures taken to ensure his custody are most easily understood as implying the complete cessation of his influence on earth rather than a curbing of his activities. In other words, 
Not only do we have a straightforward sequence of visions, one by one by one, and you just read it according to how John has delivered it, but you also have very stark language that when you just read it at face value, it describes Satan as having no influence on this earth. The post-millennial and all-millennial position have to allegorize that, spiritualize that, and say, well, it doesn't really mean what it says. It means something different. But let's look at Satan's influence on the world today. Just a few quick references to the New Testament, and we find that Satan is very much active in the church age. Satan is called the God of this world in the church age. Satan is the one in the world whom the disciples overcome, 1 John 4, 4. In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, we read that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The picture there being of a prowling lion free to track down prey. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says that Satan appears as an angel of light. He is a source of temptation. Acts chapter 5, verse 3, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5, Ephesians 4, verse 27. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 18, that Satan hindered his gospel ministry. According to Matthew 13, verse 9, Satan snatches the seeds sown by the sower, the seeds of the gospel. Acts 26, verse 18, describes Satan as holding unbelievers under his power. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul says that Satan buffets believers. Ephesians 6, verses 11 to 17, the whole armor of God, indicates that Satan attacks the church. The book of Revelation itself, in fact, if you read from the beginning part of the book until chapter 19, you read that Satan is very much active on this earth. Ultimately, all millennialists and post-millennialists have a very big problem here. And they concede that the wickedness and lies in this world are indeed a direct result of Satan's influence. And so to reconcile this with their particular perspective... They dismiss the language of chapter 20, verses 1 to 3, and the binding of Satan and his incarceration. They dismiss that language as highly symbolic and non-prophetic. Yet at the same time, they take the language around that. They take, for example, Revelation 19, verses 11 to 21, and chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, and the great white throne judgment. They take all the other details around chapter 20 and say it is prophetic take these details as meaningful but just these here in chapter 20 verses 1 to 3 don't take them literally don't take them at face value but again there's nothing in the language to suggest that John has somehow broken into some poetic flurry and doesn't want his readers to read him literally Charles Feinberg, in response to all that, said this, one cannot have Satan bound and loose at the same time. The logic of the language does not permit it. In other words, you can't be sane and say that Satan is both in the abyss, bound, incarcerated, and at the same time say he is loose and able to deceive the nations. There's a big problem. A third argument, not only do we have the sequence of the visions, argument number one, not only do we have the incarceration of the devil, argument number two, but another very important argument here, and it's probably one that you haven't thought much about, but is a very important one with respect to this discussion is this, the co-regency of the saints. The co-regency of the saints Look at the first part of verse 4 of Revelation 20. John writes, Then I saw thrones. Now, whenever you see the word thrones, obviously, that is a reference to power and authority, justice. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. 
And it raises the question, to whom does this pronoun they refer? Who will be those who will sit on these thrones and exercise delegated authority? Who are they? Well, since amillennialists and postmillennialists see this as a present reality and, and believe that the second advent of Christ brings this all to an end, they contend that the reference is to the 24 elders who are given thrones and that these 24 elders who are mentioned previously in the book of Revelation, these 24 elders are not 24 beings, but rather they represent a picture of the church. So when you read 20 verse 4, according to the amillennial or postmillennial position, you come up with this conclusion. I saw thrones and they, that is, the 24 elders, that is, the church, sat on them and judgment was given to them. So they take it as spiritual. Uh, they, they take it as, as a non-literal throne and a non-literal rule. But can this be the 24 elders? Now the 24 elders are mentioned in the book of Revelation. It, it, it begins early in the book of Revelation. The, these 24 elders are mentioned. We won't get into that. That's a whole other discussion. I do believe that these are 24 beings. They are mentioned, and they are mentioned even as recently as chapter 19, verse 4. If you go to chapter 19, verse 4, you, you have this picture, this hallelujah chorus that is described at the beginning of chapter 19 that precedes the coming of Christ that is described in verse 11. So in chapter 19, we read this, verse 1, after these things, I heard someone, something like a loud voice and a great multitude in heaven, in heaven, saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous for he is judged and the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures, they're in heaven. They're in heaven. They fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. Now that's the previous time when the 24 elders are Mentioned, And so, all millennialists and post-millennialists will say, well, when we come to chapter 20, verse 4, and the reigning of the 24, or the reigning of the people on the thrones, it's a reference to these 24. The 24 represent the church. Therefore, you have the church reigning today on thrones. And that is the view that, that we reign as a church spiritually today. We are reigning in this world. But is that the best way to understand the they in chapter 20, verse 4? There's two problems with this view. First of all, it is a separate vision. In fact, several other visions have come between this one and chapter 19, verses 1 to 4. The 24 elders are not mentioned in the near proximity to 20, verses 1 to 6. Moreover, there is a much closer, more grammatically tight referent to the they. So if you look at chapter 20, verse 4, you read, then I saw thrones and they sat on them. You see the pronoun they, and that points you to the previous context. You look, first of all, at chapter 20, verses 1 to 3, and all you read there is of an angel and Satan, and Satan is thrown into the abyss certainly doesn't relate to him. He is not given a throne to reign on. And no one would take it that it refers to that angel either. So you have to go previous in the context. So go to the end of the very end of chapter 19. And in particular, the nearest possible antecedent is in verse 19 of chapter 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. His army. And if you look even back to verse 14, 
you read the same army that is described there. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following Christ. They were following Christ on white horses. So the picture is of Christ's return to make war on earth against his enemies. And he brings with him the armies of heaven who themselves are on white horses, indicating that they are as fellow soldiers, commanders in Christ's battle. Now when you look at that and you come back to chapter 24, it is very easy and fits the picture very well when you see that these same coming armies with Christ are the very same ones who will sit on thrones. The very same ones who will sit on thrones. They will come with him and they will then reign with him. Now who are these armies? Now again, John doesn't describe it here, but if you'd ask me the question, I would say the armies... The armies are the the saints of the church who prior to this, as we discussed in the first session, were taken by Christ, seized by him, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, seized by him, and then according to 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 13, taken by him to present before his Father holy and pure and blameless. The saints are the army. The New Testament saints are the army who have been taken by Christ to heaven for that great marriage supper of the Lamb. And when he takes them, as, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, they will always now be with him. And so when he leaves his heavenly throne, around which those New Testament believers had been gathered, those New Testament church believers, they now come with Christ in the great army, and they then are given thrones to rule with Christ. Now, this concept of a future reign, a future reign for the church, not a present reign, is quite uh, quite common in New Testament teaching. Jesus said to his own disciples in Matthew 19, 27 to 28, then Peter said to him, behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That word regeneration refers to the renewal. Refers to the, the renewal of Israel, the establishment of the prophetic kingdom. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. Notice its future. We will reign. Not we are, but we will reign with him. Even in the book of Revelation itself, and this is most important, it is important to realize the promises that Jesus gives to the church. Revelation chapter 2, verse 26, to the church Thyatira, Jesus promises this, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Here it is a future promise. Believers at Thyatira, here's the promise of endurance. I will give to you authority to rule the nations. To the church at Laodicea, he says in Revelation 3.21, he who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. Again, a reference to the thrones. Later in Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10, we read this. In the praises that heaven offers the Lamb, you have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign Upon the earth. Future. Future. Speaking of the the saints. So who is that that, uh, they in verse 4? It is the New Testament believer. It is the New Testament church. And it is going to include the tribulation saints as well who were killed and were resurrected to rule. We'll get to that next. Next. 
And it is a physical, literal rain. It is a real rain, not just a spiritual one, but a real one. And that is a significant argument in favor of premillennialism. Number four, the distinction of the resurrections. Now, here's a particularly thorny issue for all millennialists and post-millennialists. Let's look now at the middle of verse 4 to the end of verse 6. John writes, And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and, and, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Now, when he says this is the first resurrection, he, he's referring to the previous comment there about the resurrection of the tribulation saints. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, what this text is is emphasizing is that there are two resurrections, two resurrections. The first one is called the first, and it is explicitly described as coming at the beginning of the millennial rule of Christ. It comes at the beginning. It comes at the start of this reign before the thousand years. And then there is a second resurrection that happens after the thousand years. So on the basis of verses 4 and 5, you have these two resurrections, and they are separated by 1,000 years. Now again, all three views take the second resurrection in verse 5, the resurrection that is the final one, everyone believes that. It's the identity of the first resurrection that is a problem, not for premillennialists, but for amillennialists and for postmillennialists. And so everything rests on the nature of this first resurrection. To what does it refer? If it happens before the thousand years, then you, what's going to happen if you believe that the thousand years are now? That it's, a, it's an age of the church, an age of gospel expansion. Then you have a problem with the timing of this resurrection. As I say, if this millennium is a present reality, as all millennialists and post-millennialists will contend, then the first resurrection has already taken place, right? Think through the logic on that. If Satan is already bound and in the abyss, if we are already reigning, as 20 verse 4a teaches, and if this is the thousand years spiritually understood, then the first resurrection has already taken place. Now, what could that be? What could that refer to? If it has already happened, think of it. What are the options for that? Well, you really have no other option than to treat this symbolically. It's not a real physical resurrection. It is some kind of other resurrection. And that's exactly what post-millennialists and amillennialists do. They say that the first resurrection that is mentioned here that precedes the thousand years is a resurrection that refers to regeneration. It's a resurrection that refers to the moment when, when we are brought from spiritual death to spiritual life. Kind of sounds possible, but we'll get to a problem with that. Some post-millennialists or all-millennialists will say, well, maybe it doesn't refer to regeneration. Perhaps it refers to a, a state of perfection. When, when, when Christians are, uh, when they die and they go to heaven and, and they receive uh, th this perfected state, maybe that is what uh, is being referred to here by the first resurrection. But the problem is, the same verb is used to describe both resurrections. 
in the first resurrection, in verse 4, they came to life. They came to life at the end of verse 4. And it is the verb azison. Azison. That same verb is used in verse 5. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. Same verb used. And so by all normal rules of understanding language, when you use the same words in close context without any other indication, you, un- you understand them the same way. But that is not what amillennialists or postmillennialists will do. They will insist on a different interpretation for the first occurrence of that verb. But moreover, even beyond that, when we look at how this verb is used in the rest of Revelation, and it is used several times, chapter 2, verse 8, chapter 13, verse 14, it is never used to refer to spiritual regeneration. It's never used to refer to some kind of spiritual perfection. It's used, for example, in 2, verse 8, to refer to Christ who was dead and who came to life. That's not spiritual regeneration. That's referring to his physical resurrection three days after his death. Moreover, go back to chapter 20, verse 4. Who is it that is participating in this first resurrection? Who is it that is undergoing this transformation? Well, if you read in the context, you read that those who came to life in this first resurrection that starts the millennial reign are those who were beheaded because of their witness. They were beheaded, literally, because of their testimony of Jesus. So think through the logic on this. Those who were beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, according to the amillennial and postmillennial position, still need spiritual regeneration. It doesn't fit. It does not work within the context. Or they would say those who were beheaded need spiritual perfection. Well, if you're beheaded, you're instantly brought into the presence of Christ. If you have the testimony of Jesus, you're still not in need of some other act to be done to you. So why do you need a a resurrection, even if it is spiritual, for those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus? One theologian says this, because both the first and the second resurrection are described in identical terminology, azeson, the verb to come to life, and because no qualifying adjectives or adverbs or anything else indicate that these two resurrections are different in kind, the attempt to make them different appears purely arbitrary. It is introduced only because of a theological bias. A theological presupposition. Therefore, since this first resurrection is a physical resurrection, and we know it has not happened yet, we can confidently tie this, as John does, to the moment when this resurrection, referring to not the resurrection of the church saints, 1 Thessalonians 4, but the resurrection of the tribulation saints. The resurrection of the tribulation saints. And this is the picture that we get taken simply. Now we have one more argument in favor of a premillennial position. The necessity of the Adamic reign. The necessity of the Adamic reign. Now we see a reference to the reign of Christ in verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him. They will reign with Christ for a thousand years. This picture is the picture of Christ on his throne, reigning and ruling and sharing his reign with both New Testament saints who had been raptured at a previous moment, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, as well as reigning with the tribulation saints who had just been resurrected, 
Christ will reign and share his reign with them. Now, the early church fathers were pretty straightforward on this. The early church believed that Christ would return to establish this millennial kingdom on earth. It, they believed it was important for him to reign on this planet. However, that premillennial position was eroded quite early on in church history by what is called the spiritual vision model. And the spiritual vision model is this belief that God's ultimate purposes are all spiritual and not physical. All spiritual and not material. Now some of that kind of thinking has certainly made its way into the church today. In fact, it may even be in your thinking as well. Well, material, the physical world, it's inherently unsatisfactory. The best is always and only spiritual. For example, you see this coming through in various theologians today of the amillennial and postmillennial position. Herman Baving, for example, a very famous uh, Dutch theologian, and I, I love his writings on the attributes of God and the doctrine of salvation, but he has some very d different views on, on eschatology, and he makes this statement which indicates this spiritual vision model, this idea, this, this, this conviction that if, if it has to do with the material, it's, it's inferior. He says this, chiliasm or millennialism, is another word for it, the idea that Christ will reign on earth for a millennium, he says, it is not of Christian, but of Jewish and Persian origin. He's got a very strange understanding of this, but this is what he goes on to say. He says, it is always based on a compromise between the expectations of an earthly salvation and those of a heavenly state of blessedness. It would appear that Kiliasm's strength lies in the Old Testament, but actually this is not the case. The Old Testament is decidedly not Kiliastic or millennial. So he's completely written it off and said there's no basis in the Bible whatsoever to see Jesus reigning and ruling on this earth. If you would take that model and picture it, you could consider it this way. Think of a, uh, of a scale, and, and the higher you go up is the more important it is. And if you look at life and the different spheres of life, you would look at it this way. You have the material world at the bottom, just purely material, and it is of very little importance. Then you have the second level of spiritual and material. It is of greater importance, but ultimately it is the spiritual world. And in the view of premillennialism and amillennialism, there's often this conviction that what is most important has nothing to do with the material. We are all just headed for a spiritual, non-material ultimate end. And that kind of bias, that kind of presupposition affects why you would, how you would view Christ ruling on this present world, in this present world. In fact, several amillennialists and postmillennialists have derided premillennialists and said, you guys are guilty of crass materialism with Christ reigning on this world. That's just not serious. Craig Blazing again writes this, ancient Christian premillennialism Weakened to the point of disappearance, he's talking about early on in church history, when the spiritual vision model of eternity became dominant in the church, a future kingdom on earth simply did not fit well in an eschatology that stressed personal ascent to a spiritual realm. If your view of salvation is just an ascent to a purely spiritual realm, you have no place, no interest, no priority for Christ ruling in a place of earth, water, air. No purpose to it. How, how is that moving redemptive history forward to have Christ descend from heaven to reign on this earth? Heaven is better than this earth. That's the presupposition. But why is a future earthly kingdom necessary? Why is it important for Christ to rule on this earth? How would you answer that question? I would answer it in one simple statement. It's important because he has to complete unfinished business. Michael Vlock, in his wonderful book called He Will Reign Forever, says this, Jesus, as the last Adam, 
is destined to successfully rule from and over the earth. That that was a task that was given to the first Adam. But Adam failed. The last Adam, however, will succeed. Jesus' kingdom reign will be from and over the earth, and he will share his reign with his followers and complete the kingdom mandate of Genesis 1, verses 26 to 28. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, you have the very first commission that is given to Adam that he was to, he was to rule over the face of the earth as God's vice regent over his creation. And as we know, Adam failed. And as Mike Vlock helpfully explains here is that the second Adam, a term that is used by Paul to describe Christ, this second Adam, his future reign is so important because he comes to finish the mandate that Adam the first could not fulfill. Now what's interesting to note about this is we, we easily recognize the representational headship of the first Adam and the second Adam with respect to obedience to God's law. In fact, your mind is probably going immediately to Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 21. There Paul lays out this theological understanding, the first Adam and his requirement to be obedient to God's law. He failed. He failed, and as a result brought forth sin and death. But Paul goes on to state in Romans 5 verses 12 to 21 that the last Adam, the second Adam, was also given the responsibility to obey God's law and he did so perfectly and as a result brought righteousness and life. So we see that Christ had that role in his first advent to fulfill the mandate given to Adam that Adam could not fulfill. And that mandate related to obedience to God's law. But there was another mandate that was given. There was another mandate that was given to Adam in the creation context, in the garden, and that was to rule over God's creation. And again, what we find is this, the first Adam with respect to the reign over God's world, resulted in failure. It brought about chaos and decay. It brought about curse. But we see with the second Adam, the last Adam, that he will fulfill what Adam could not. He already did so with respect to obedience to God's law, and now he will do so with respect to the mandate to rule over this world The last Adam will reign over God's world successfully and he will bring order and prosperity. And this full representational headship where Christ fulfills everything that Adam could not is what premillennialism advocates. That Christ will show how it's done. He did so in his first advent And as a result, brought to us salvation. And he will do so in his second advent. He will show us how it's done. He will show how to rule over this creation as was originally given to Adam in the garden with that creation mandate. He will show us how it's done. And by virtue of his success in his first advent, he will bring us along to rule with him. Representation is so important and it plays a very important role in this discussion. Well, these are the five arguments in defense of premillennialism. The sequence of the visions, the incarceration of the devil, the co-regency of the saints, the distinction of the resurrections, and the necessity of the Adamic reign. And as we close Let's step back for a moment and just remember, this is not just some theological dispute, some theoretical discussion. This relates to us today. The details of God's future redemptive activity are just as important as the details of God's past 
redemptive historic activity. And in the same way that we are to take encouragement and comfort from what God has done in the past, by reading the scriptures and reading of all these details of God's great redemptive works, so we are to look to the future, to look what he has described will take place, and we are to take comfort, we are to take joy, we are to take hope and surety from that as well. And when we see that Christ will return, and he will reign, and we will reign with him, and there will be a perfect administration of justice and peace On this earth, we take great comfort from that, especially in a day like we see today, where the absence of righteousness and the horrible blasphemies and the perversion that is spread around this world seems at many times to overwhelm us. We know He is coming and He will bring justice. And it will be on this earth. And so we pray, come, Lord Jesus. Let's do that. Indeed, Heavenly Father, as we look at the world around us and we see the decay, we see the ever unfolding of the Apostle Paul's words that things will go from bad to worse. We many times look around us and recognize that we are living in Sodom and Gomorrah. The perversion is displayed at heights that haven't been seen since those two cities once existed The blasphemies that are hurled against you hurt us. The efforts of governments and entertainment lobbies, corporations to silence the gospel message and to ridicule believers, and many times concerns us deeply and concerns us about our children and about the future of the church. And it is so easy, Father, to grow discouraged. To grow discouraged or to try to take measures into our own hands and do things that were never given for us to do. So we thank you for these words. We thank you that you're not done with this planet. And that before you do destroy it, you will come in your son to complete unfinished business. To destroy your enemies, to destroy the lies, to bring righteousness and true peace and justice, and to reign. And we long for that day. And we pray, Maranatha. Lord, come. Amen.